Here to welcome you is Kate Trainer. Hi there, welcome everyone. I'm Kate Trainer. I'm a corporate vice president at Parkcel, overseeing client delivery for a number of our enterprise accounts. Thank you for taking time to join us today and welcome. Parkcel has been evolving tremendously over the past couple of years with the steepest curve in the most recent months of course, tied to COVID-19. Uh, we're gonna be talking about some of the improvements and innovations we've put together in the way project leaders work. We're excited to share some of that with you today. Our cast of speakers include my colleagues here, John, Roberta, and Ruben. They'll give a bit of a personal insight when they uh, speak in just a moment. Thank you. Let's advance the slides, please. For me personally, my own background comes through the clinical technology path. I learned about EDC in the early days, advance the slide, thank you, and joined Parkcell's technology group, Perceptive Informatics. I learned about CTMS, IVRS, EPRO, all the other components, and all of the enablement that they provided. I'm also a poster child for opportunity in Parkcell having moved across the company into different roles, now heading up project leadership for many of our enterprise accounts. I believe the key to opportunities is taking risks, careful risks, and being willing to try new things. Create a network to support yourself. Everyone here on this call is part of my network for sure, and that also helps as well. You saw the slides rotating, a little bit about uh, the new Par Excel. Next slide, please. We're a CRO providing a broad range of clinical services to pharma and biotech. We have nearly 20,000 people, including over 2,000 people in technology, over 1,000 people in regulatory, and we're in over 100 countries. Next slide, please. Part of our corporate messaging is the breadth of experience and services that we provide. As we've been around for 38 years, as you saw, We've amassed talent and experience across this broad spectrum. Perhaps you noticed the new Parexcel brand. We're very proud of it. It's the look and feel of the materials in this presentation. It's the materials that are available in the professional social media that you see, other media, industry, some of the rotating slides that kicked off our presentation today. And even more importantly for us, it's our new taglines and what this means to us. You may have seen them, hashtag with heart, hashtag no going back. Especially in a COVID-19 world, we all hear on a daily basis, how can we incorporate these things into our projects going forward? Uh, internally, we're transforming and innovating that, and you'll hear more about that in a few moments. Next slide, please. For the past five years, we've worked across a number of therapeutic areas. Counting each project as, as one, which of course doesn't indicate the size of the study, et cetera. You can see though that hematology and oncology is our, is our greatest portfolio. In fact, this is the, growest, the most growing franchise we have internally. And we're growing our own franchise to be able to support our team members so that we can understand and address these study needs. By providing uh, more information, we're making sure that we're helping folks share experiences leverage medical knowledge, and creatively think and provide options to help our clients meet patient needs, intricate patient needs. You know, what we're really trying to do though is think less assembly line, more dynamic. That's what we're really working with our team on. Of course, we're a regulated industry and we ensure we follow the rules with solid infrastructure and support. Next slide, please. So Parexcel Project Leadership, this is really what we're gonna be our main focus for today. We're deliberate in our choice of the word leader over manager. It indicates the more dynamic world that I mentioned a moment ago. Leadership is about setting a vision, goals for the project success, understanding client objectives, uh, empowering your team to achieve patient needs and goals where management is a more administrative day-to-day -day actions that are happening. 
So there's frameworks of SOPs, training, and organizational support for project managers, including here at ParXL. In order to enable the leadership quotient that I mentioned, we need to really consider a mindset. Now, I came up with this analogy myself, so this is not the opinion of ParXL, this is the opinion of K-Trainer. So think about a time when you learned something academically and then had to put it into practice, apply it in real life. I thought a good simple example, we've all heard different ones, is driving. I had to go to driver's ed. Many of you here in the American states require that we do take driver's education training. So um, when you have that experience, when you learned in driver's ed, it prepared you, but you really had to engage critical thinking in the application of those things you've learned. And this is the analogy to leaders. You have to think about uh, situational information, where you are on the road, managing interactions with others, often at a very high speed in order to get to where you want to go safely. The same analogy applies to uh, ParXL and project leadership. Today, project leadership is a puzzle, especially in unprecedented times. You know, when we look at the number of elements that have to be considered, we have to think about client dynamics. What languages, what are the words they use, their nomenclature? What is their culture of? Is it short-term data or long-term data? Are, are they looking at things at a program asset level and the overall objectives? In my experience, it's a broad spectrum. In COVID-19, we know that clients are thinking of things like doing remote visits, but how does that affect their timelines? What's going on with their sites and patients? All of those things have to be considered at this point. We also know in therapeutic areas, right, besides COVID-19, we have to make sure that these are progressing. We have a number of considerations here, and there could be indications within a disease, like oncology. What about prostate, lung, colon, or blood cancers? We have to think about all of those things, the protocol objectives, of course, the patient, and other people who can be impacted, including their family and caregivers. There's such a range here. We have observational research, Roberta comes from that world, or other areas where we could be dealing with the impact of sunscreen or a very vulnerable pediatric patient population. All of these things apply. So we, of course, have to think about the goals for the program itself. These are all very important to understand. Is it a patent extension? Is it for an approval? Is it for a marketing label or something? All of those critical thinking elements have to come into play. We need to, as leaders, ensure that all of those puzzle pieces fit together. And of course, in a complex COVID-19 world, that becomes even more complex. We're just thinking across multiple boundaries. Project leaders create and lead this dynamic mapping for each project, evolving with all the changing needs and considerations. Some components are known and practical. Others require that deeper creative thinking EQ, we have to be able to engage others with expertise and use our access to experts we have in ParXL, tools and information that is provided to help us make the best decisions and lead our colleagues. Especially in today's world, we understand the greater need for leaders. We value and support our team members who can understand our stakeholders with huge emphasis on patients and their experience during clinical research. On that note, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Roberta O'Kelly, who will share more on putting the patients first. Thank you, Kate. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And as Kate said, I am going to talk about how um, we at ParkCell are putting patients first. A brief history of my time um, at ParkCell. I've been here over six years, but I do have 25 years of experience in the industry. Uh, and I've come what I call the traditional route of coordinator to CRA to project manager before I came to ParXL, project director, and then currently I am a clinical, excuse me, a senior client delivery director within our biotech unit at ParXL. But I came in overseeing the RWE space of project leaders at ParXL. As Kate indicated, it is one of the areas in which I have specialized over time and have spent most of my career in the late phase post-market approval. However, as we go through some of the information I'm going to provide, I've also been 
fortunate enough to learn other areas since I've been with Par Excel, which makes it one of the exciting things to me about being here. And lastly on the slide, I am a subject matter expert in the managed access programs, which ultimately make sure that patients are put first. Next slide, please. So as we've talked about patients first with heart, it is important to understand that Par Excel has always taken the time to put patients first in the development of therapy that benefits the patient. We take this very seriously and do it with empathy, making sure that each person on our team remembers that ultimately what we are doing is for patient benefit. We appreciate that they are people. We don't look at this as a 30,000 person study. We look at each thing, each person as an individual. The decisions and understanding of a patient point of view, which I'll talk to in a moment, and we act with urgency because we understand, especially in the time of COVID, that the right therapies to the patients quickly and safely is ultimately the most important. And keeping the privacy of our patients is as important to us as it is to them. Next slide, please. So patient centricity, which I had just brought up, we've been leading in this prior to COVID. This is not something that is new to Parkcell. It's been something in the industry that we've been very proud of keeping patients at the center and designing all of our treatments or all of our trials with the patient at the center of our focus. We talk about this with our clients as they come to us and ask for our advice. So before the study begins, we talk with our patient-centric protocol optimization group to look at the patient and the caregiver needs, extremely important. If you're looking at one of the studies that I'm working on is cystic fibrosis in children. So keep in mind that this involves not just the patient, but the caregiver and likely the family. Providing additional information about the tests and procedures are necessary to explain to the entire family what's going to happen. While at the same time, ensuring that we minimize the impact on their quality of life. Just because the treatment works doesn't necessarily mean that the quality is as good. And then during the study, what we help to design is reducing the number of visits as much as possible, or can we make them virtual and decentralized, which I'm also going to address in a moment. Using study-related technology to simplify the process for the patient and caregiver. Apps, obviously everybody's aware of apps, but what apps can we use to help this? Offering travel help. This is a big thing. When you get some of your very subspecialized groups, cystic fibrosis, um, certain nephrologies, very rare diseases, often those patients have to travel quite a distance to get to a major medical center. Let's offer help to get them there. And then providing the right information in the format for the patients that keeps them motivated and engaged. As we're all aware, the longer the trial, the harder it is to keep patients engaged. So we help design what is necessary to keep them engaged. Next slide, please. So we've talked a little bit about patients can't wait. We see this in all of our trials. And while the word disrupting is typically a negative connotation, in this sense, it is a good thing. Disrupting the conduct in the way that we've always done it to make it easier for the patients to participate makes it more meaningful to them and their caregivers. It makes them want to be part of our study. Speeding up the recruitment process by using our typical, um, the old typical methods doesn't work anymore. So what can we do to find these patients and make it easier to get them in quicker? Identifying any area where we can reduce the burden. And I, we will talk a little bit more about that, the efficiencies, and then innovations. And I think you're going to hear a lot of that throughout our discussion today. What innovations can we do to make this as much as possible to keep this in their home? On to the next slide, please. So I'm just gonna to touch on what are decentralized clinical trials. And as I mentioned earlier, this is something that we have worked on for quite some time at Park Cell and in my area of expertise and doing observational work, we do a lot of DCTs. And we, you see it called many things. It's virtual, it's remote, it's sightless in phase three or direct to patient in phase four. But they're designed to make it Again, easy, taking part as much as possible in the patient's home or local community. So with the next slide, please. Okay. 
So what's possible um, today and looking forward to tomorrow? Why are these so important? Well, if you kind of start taking a funnel approach, you look at the fact that there are 40,000 clinical trials recruiting, and this is just in the U.S. alone. We know that there's more. But 80% are usually delayed due to recruitment problems. And those of you listening to us have all experienced this. The middle section is kind of what I talked about. 70% of these patients live more than two hours away from the study center. Oncology patients, it's quite a distance for them to drive. These are sick patients. We also don't want to take their time away from them in order to be from home. But 85% of all clinical trials fail to retain enough patients. And so that's why a lot of times the designs for trials, you see what is the number we're screening versus what is the number we're enrolling. And at Paroxel, we work to make this patient's first to shorten that number. And then as it goes through, recruitment problems are fewer, studies go faster, and we try to help the average dropout rate. Again, keeping the patient in mind throughout the entire journey of the trial. So can we go to the next slide, please? So there are a great deal of approaches in what we call DCTs, a spectrum of approaches. You can choose all the way from as simple as just an app to fully decentralized trials. And I want to talk through a few of them. But the patient-focused traditional trials, the ones I think most of us have grown up doing and seeing, um, we still utilize the patient's insight to enhance a traditional study that a client may have in mind. But we do try to ease the burden by making these easier. Hybrid trials. Um, during the times of COVID, many of your children are doing hybrid school. Same idea, where we have some in-person visits, and then we have some at home. So we reduce the number of actual in-person visits. Can we bring in a visiting nurse to do some of the, I call them administrative visits, but things that are easily done at home? Lab draws, blood pressure checks, where the more important, more significant MRIs obviously need to be done in a hospital setting. And then finally, virtual trials. I'm going to show in a moment, but I'm working on one that is completely virtual, where identification was done through Facebook. And we have an app, or we have a question the patient completes on a monthly basis. And so it is awesome. We have remote PIs. We have remote coordinators. So it is, it's something I'm very excited about. And so I'll speak to that in just a moment. Okay. But more importantly, if we can go to the next slide, please. I want to talk about it's always selecting the right service for each project. These aren't cookie cutter. We can't just say for project oncology and project nephrology and project cystic fibrosis that those all are the same. Patients are different. Their needs are different. So we look at a variety of options, which you can see through our journey on this slide. Telemedicine. Virtual study visits using video calls to the patient's smartphone. I think most of us are experiencing telehealth visits with our own physicians, so we are well aware of what this is, but let's also use it to the advantage of clinical trials. Home nursing, as I just talked about, doing procedures in the patient's home. Simple e-source, a tool that allows sites to document assessments and interactions while still conducting remote visits when they cannot visit the site. The data collected is eventually entered into the EDC, so it's not data loss, which is what we're concerned about. And then one other thing on here is direct to patient options. During COVID, when patients don't want to be coming into the office, but how do you get them their critically needed medication? And so we have worked through ways in our clinical logistics group to be able to provide this directly to a patient's home. Okay. And if we can go to the next slide, please. And these are some of the examples that I've kind of touched on throughout my presentation, because helping patients is what we really do love to do. And I, I talk about the managed access, which is one of the three here. The first one I mentioned is assistive fibrosis in a phase two setting. When COVID hit, you obviously don't want um, pulmonary compromised patients coming anywhere near a facility that may have COVID patients. So what solutions did we come up with? Because these were in major cities. So as I talked about, we put together a plan to arrange travel because they were already traveling a great distance. Hotel coverage, we needed these patients to stay overnight for a PK draw in the morning. 
But again, you're bringing additional family members, especially in the time of COVID, these unprecedented times. So we provided games or other activities for the family members. We mapped it out for each particular patient. The second one, um, an oncology trial, it, which is in a managed access program or, or a compassionate use, for those of you that are not aware of the term. With quarantine, patients didn't want to come to the hospital. So again, we've got to get the medications to them. So we did telehealth visits that assessed the overall health, updated logistics, and then we're able to do home drug delivery. We did, yes, change project plans. We did have to update processes within the communities to do the drug delivery. But ultimately, the most important thing, we did not interrupt treatment for the patients. And then we did get the data. And then finally, disease registries and ultra rare diseases. How do you reach so many patients with an ultra rare indication, knowing that there are so few out there? So we came up with an idea to do some site-based, so where there is a physician and a PI and you see that physician, but direct the patient. And this is an exciting thing. It's a virtual option, community outreach, but we do have a central IRB approval. We increase enrollment, additional real world evidence data, where I live my life, and then additional treatment data. And so this was helpful because it was based on a disease and not a specific um, treatment. And then one more slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So patient centricity and the innovation center. Again, incorporating at every step. So I've told you about before and during and now at the end. We, we bring in patient advisory boards. Um, the managed access program can be considered at a clinical trial end. We want to bridge programs for these trial participants prior to marketing authorization. We've all had that thought. The program works for this patient, but now it's three, six months before they can get the drug. What do we do with these patients? So we also want to find ways to thank the patients. It's more than just saying a thank you, but going out back to the community and thanking everybody for their participation. We provide the study results, whether it's to the investigator or find a way to provide it to the patient. I think we see that more and more with news releases coming out. It's very helpful. And then ultimately, working especially with the advisory boards to price this treatment well. All different things that need to be done, but we put them together as part of our patient centricity, thinking about the patient in each step of this. So thank you for letting me take some time to talk to you about this. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, John McBride. Thank you, Roberta. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is John McBride. I'm a Senior Director of Project Management. I've been at ParXL for seven years and have been in the industry going on roughly 15. Uh, as Roberta noted, she had maybe a typical uh, career path. I'm going to say I have somewhat of an atypical career path. So I'm a pharmacist by training. Um, I was introduced to clinical research as I was finishing up a postdoctoral fellowship in medical affairs. It was something I found that I liked, that I enjoyed doing, and so decided to kind of focus my career path on clinical research, and so the rest has been somewhat history. I have been within the project management realm for those 15 years, so started as a PL, uh, became a PD, and now a senior director. If you go to the next slide, please. So today, I'm going to discuss how ParXL is transforming the way that we do business by becoming a truly integrated, project-driven organization that is easier to do business with and easier to work for. So that easier to work for is what I really want to focus in with that vision towards the project leadership role. Before we go there, let's all take a step back and hopefully we can agree that being a PL is hard. It's a difficult position. We're asked to deliver projects on time, on budget, with high quality, with high client satisfaction, and as Roberta and Kate mentioned, with heart. So keeping the patient in the mind of everything that we do. That's a tall, tall ask, right? There's a lot of moving parts to a clinical trial. What we do in order to be successful is we rely a lot on data and systems. However, I am personally a little frustrated at times with the, that data and with those systems. So think about it. A lot of times our systems are not interconnected. They're not integrated. They don't speak to one another. And so as I'm entering information maybe into a system about timeline management, I have to then go into a system to record information about resourcing and finances. They're very disparate. What I found equally as frustrating, and I hope you probably share the same view, 
is that because those systems don't speak to one another, they're not integrated, not only am I wasting valuable time double data entering or repeating similar but somewhat different activities across systems, but I then have to reconcile that data across those systems. I'm oftentimes spending time just saying, okay, is this data right or wrong? Where did they pull this from? It says I have 10,000 hours to complete the study for CRAs in my resourcing database, but it says I need 12,000 in finance. Which one is right? To me, that's a little bit of a waste of time, and it doesn't allow us to do our best work as project leaders. So that is, is frustrating, but let's all take another step back and let's imagine a world together where none of those problems exist, right? So we have an integrated single platform, single source of truth where you can manage your timelines, your budgets, your scoping, your resources, all within one system that talks to each other. So you're not, you don't have that administrative burden. You don't spend that time trying to reconcile that data across systems to make heads or tails of it. Imagine in that same world, that operational plan or that single source of truth isn't created at award, but it's started pre-award. So all that work that goes into our bid defense meetings and all the strategy we put into winning that, that project and getting onto that impactful study, that doesn't go away. That's all created within that same system and it's carried throughout. And as you go from pre-award to award to maintenance and close, you're just fine tuning along the way. Uh, I, that's a world I would definitely like to live in. Let's also imagine that in that world, imagine the visibility that you would have. All that data is there in front of you speaking the same language. You'd have visibility to your projects to make better decisions and identify risks. But your organization, we are able to have that same level of visibility across projects, across programs and across departments. Just the administrative burden alone would be terrific. So that is an imaginary, that isn't an imaginary world as you probably guessed already. That is exactly the world that we're living in today. Now I will say that we are rolling this out um, in the proper channel. So there's a proper change management plan in place. We're rolling these out in pieces so not to overwhelm people. Uh, but the vast majority of these components I'll speak to today are live and the, the next components are coming live in the future, uh, next couple of months actually. So we are at ParXL, uh, changing the way that we do business uh, and hopefully making it easier to work for. Uh, we do have this single source integrated platform where you'll be doing all of your scoping and costing activities, both pre and post award. You're doing your project scheduling or your timelines in the same system. That's all done with your resourcing that same system and is linked to your finances. So certainly a, a, a better world than maybe that uh, we've lived in in the past. Um, and this might seem easy. Go ahead and go to the next slide. But it's not as easy as you think. If you're like me, when this was all being rolled out and I was part of the teams that were developing it, I was thinking to myself, why haven't we done this already? You know, this seems easy, right? The Monday morning quarterback, you know, why aren't we doing this already? So easy to do. Um, but it isn't that easy. And I'll kind of go through some of the steps why. Think about it. If we have all these different systems, they can't, they don't speak the same language. And so they're there for the integrations and the mapping becomes nearly impossible. Those systems don't speak the same language and have the same core curriculum or core vocabulary. You can try to integrate them, and, and we do, uh, but the data is always a little wonky, right? You're always doing that reconciliation. Well, you know, this isn't really compa comparing apples to apples, but it gets us close. Uh, so what we've done is we completely went back and we did a, a fully harmonized, integrated data model across all of our systems. So you can break this down into four areas. Your resource breakdown structure, which is the role so of who is going to be doing the work. That's important, right? We don't want it to be called CRA1 and senior CRA in two different systems. They have to speak the same language. You have your location breakdown structure. Where is that work going to be done? Global, regionally, or country? It's important. Cost breakdown structure, differentiating between indirect costs and direct costs. That's important. And last and certainly not least, the work breakdown structure. So what activities are going to get done? The what? And that's what I'm actually going to use to, to bring us, you know, kind of to, to hammer this home and ensure that you're understanding sort of the, the drastic changes we're changing. Go ahead into the next slide. So under the typical state, probably the world that most of us are work, used to working in for many years, you have something that looks like this. On the left-hand side of your slide, you have a, some type of project planning system with a set of activities, right, that work breakdown structure. Here we're talking about EDC Go Live. In the middle, you have your pricing tool. Somewhat similar, but yet not exact, somewhat different set of language for virtually the same amount of activities, the same type of activities. Worse yet, on the right-hand side, you have the financial system. Again, similar set of activities, different level of detail there, don't talk the same language. All the same issues we talked about at the start, they don't talk the same language, it causes us as PLs a lot of headaches. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is exactly what we've changed by 
creating this harmonized infrastructure, this integrated data structure that talks to one another across systems and moving hopefully most systems together as one, you have this one consistent flow of activities going across your entire project plan. As you pull the lever to say increase your timelines by three months, that's automatically linked to now your pricing tool. That's changing by three months and you can easily see scenario planning. You can see the benefits there. It's also linked to your finances. It's linked to your resourcing. So if you change by three months, the timeline, your resources are also adjusting by three months. It's a lot of automation. Now, again, we still rely on you being leaders, going back to Kate's uh, presentation. You know, this isn't just pushing buttons and it's done perfectly, right? Uh, we have to set up those algorithms and that automation in the 80-20 rule. I always feel like I sit in the 20 side of that rule. Um, projects are always so unique and project specific, but I'd rather start with something than nothing that we had today. Not only did we simplify or integrate and harmonize that data across all systems, we tried to simplify our lives too. Again, being a PL is hard. In that process, we went from having over 25 pricing tools to down just one across the organization. That's a huge win right there. But we went from having nearly 2,300 different unique activities down to 500. That's an 80 nearly 80% reduction. So think about that as a PL. What does that mean to you? That means you have fewer activities to resource against, fewer activities to take revenue against, easier to do business with, easier to work for. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. All right, so hopefully at this point you can sort of, you're, you're buying into what I'm selling and uh, you know I'm super excited. I hope you can sort of see that through my presentation. I, I love this new world. Again, I kind of was like, why are we doing this all along? But if I haven't told you thus far, let's recap. So we've moved to a fully integrated, single platform, single source of truth for everything related to project scoping, timelines, resourcing, budgeting, and it's directly linked to your resources. Again, tools are now all talking the same language. The administrative burden of entering information or like information into the same system has gone away or been dramatically reduced. The time that you spend trying to just reconcile the data and to figure out what's up or down is gone. You can spend more time looking at that data to decide what are the best decisions for your project to move that project forward while also identifying risks. So again, making our lives much simpler day to day. You've heard me mention finances a couple times throughout the presentation. What I mean by that is it's not actually in the same exact system, right? But it's now they all talk the same language. And what in our world makes for good financing? I'll answer that, it's good resourcing. So if I can have the right people doing the right work at the right amount of time for the right amount of time, I have good financing, right? And what I mean by right, as a, I mean budgeted. And so, I've heard it described as it's now just a simple push of a button. It's not quite that simple, but it's pretty close. So you think about it, if you have your resource plan and you fine tune that as best that you can, you have your actuals to date, in the world we all live in for revenue recognition, which is a percent complete or 606, that is your finances, right? You have your actuals, you have your demand of how much resource you need to buy a particular role for a particular activity, it's a push of a button. You push it through, so the month-end close process becomes significantly easier than it is today. It's much more accurate, and I feel like as a project leader, I have much more control over the data. I don't have to spend all that time trying to fight, is it right or is it wrong? So there's numerous other examples of, of how this is benefiting our lives as PLs, um, not just as PLs, but all the functional leads and across the organization. Uh, I'm super excited about the tool. I hope you guys can see that. Uh, and on that, I'll go ahead and end. I thank you, and I'll pass it over to Ruby. Thank you very much, John. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruben Savages, and I'm a senior director here at Par Excel. Um, similar to, Rebe to Roberta, we, I actually followed a similar path, you know, going from that clinical research into the project management. I will say, it says 20 years of CRO industry. I've been at Parexcel for eight. My first CRO experience before Parexcel is the only one I've had besides Parexcel. We may have gone through about four acquisitions in about 13 years, but that helped me learn a lot about the CRO industry and really be prepared to come into Parexcel. And, and like I said, eight years here and counting, and it'll be a lot more. Um, I am a managing project director, means I work on enterprise accounts, I have responsibility for some of those accounts, but one of the highlights of my job and one of the reasons why I love being at Parexcel is the fact that I'm allowed to do the things that I enjoy. I 
Training has been near to my heart since my nursing years, many years ago. And I love to be able to provide some of that training. And so I lead the efforts in the global project leadership with regional trainers in the Americas, EMEA, and Asia Pac, and that helps tremendously. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm here to talk to you guys about the people. We've heard about the Par Excel in general. We heard about the systems through John. Roberto talked about that patient centricity, which is so important to our heart. And so how do we do that with the people? People being the most, one of the most important resources for any contract research organization. If we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna to talk to you about two things. One of them is the onboarding into Par Excel, and another one is what happens after that and how we continue to nurture our employees. So I call it a three-prong approach because the onboarding doesn't happen with just one aspect of one thing. Um, it is coordinated through the line managers because they provide that roadmap to new people coming into the organization, making sure they are connected to the right thing, that they are signed up for the right training, uh, we do have a project lead induction week. Uh, we had to innovate with that, right? We are now in a world of COVID. We can't bring all these people together like we used to before. We hope we're gonna be able to do that again. Never lose the faith on that, but how do we keep people engaged? After that week, we now do what we call mixers about once every couple of weeks or every month. We can bring some of the new people together bring some of our leadership together and, and have an opportunity to mix different training groups and be able to continue that learning process that started on that week. And then we strengthen all this through a good mentor program. Be having somebody assigned so that the line managers have that support. And it is about a six week program. It varies depending on the individual, what their background is and their needs might be. Now, one thing that we encourage during the induction week is that peer-to-peer -peer support, okay? Um, I always said when I came to Par Excel, at the beginning, you always feel, and I'm a koi aficionado, so I raise fish, but you may feel that you're that little fish on that big pond. You know, Kate talked about almost 20,000 employees. How do you identify and make yourself the individual that feels that contribute to this? And I say, well, when we looked at people and brought them in here, we saw them because of that little koi had some great colors that we wanted to put into this pond as a good addition. And as that grows, then those colors continue to even grow more and show it even more in the combination with all the other fish in the pond. So that's how we do it. And how does that fish grow? Is by eating the food, right? you know, creating those relationships with the others. And that's exactly what we encourage people to do. We want them to get connected with the people there in the induction week, have people that they can call on. I still go to the people that I trained with eight years ago. I still call on them and they call on me so that we provide support to each other over the years. Um, the last thing in this slide and something that I'm just thrilled about is our trainers in, in that induction week and for other trainings, including uh, budgeting and finance and things like that, are actual project leads. So they are in the trenches, they do the work, and we just set time aside for them to provide this training. So they are able to answer the questions right then and there and address any concerns that people may have. We can go to the next slide. So the onboarding process is what I talked about already, but how do we maintain it in moving forward? So after that week, you know, people do some of these trainings. And as I said, you know, in our COVID world, we have to be careful because sitting around in a computer and doing training for a few for a, a few days and not having a lot of connection with people because it may not be assigned yet is not good. We need to make sure that people feel connected through the line manager, through the mentor, and through anybody else to make sure that they are feeling a part of the organization. We provide, um, a, we have curriculums that are really centered to the aspect of the trial you're gonna be working on. For example, if you are in, in, in an early phase study, uh, then those are the people that, that you get a training assigned that has the components to be able to run those trials. Same thing for phase two and three or real world evidence as well. Something else that I'm really excited about when you come to the CRO and one of the things that I find the most advantageous of being in this world is that you're able to get experience in more than one therapeutic area. Kate talked about, you know, our growth in oncology. Uh, you also saw infectious disease over there very high. So if you haven't done training, if you haven't worked in that particular area, I love to be challenged and said, here's a new therapeutic area. And we provide 
great training through our medical experts that have that knowledge. And just as an example, and this goes back to Roberta's presentation, I've, I've been really lucky to participate on a trial where the product was being developed in Europe and it actually has to be shipped outside and has a very short, short shell life of about 48 to 72 hours. You can imagine the logistics without COVID, trying to get that product across the pond and trying to get it to an operating room in the right time. It has been difficult. So imagine adding COVID to it when you don't have commercial flights anymore from one day to the next. And the team, because of the ability to work with our logistics team together, was able to work out um, charter flights to get the product in time to that operating room and make it happen. But this is the kind of innovation that I'd love to see the Paracel doing that we can bring to our patients because at the end of the day, it's about giving the patients what they need and making them the priority. So that personal development never stops. You know, we do have evaluations and, and our line managers are great at being able to quarterly meet with, with our direct reports, give them the support, give them the encouragement that they need it, is, it has been a great experience for me to be here, and I hope that I can translate that to anybody who wants to come to join us. With that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Kate so that we can have our questions. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Roberta, John, and Ruben, for your excellent presentation so far. We are in the Q&A section, so if you can advance to the next slide, it will show you how to submit your questions if you'd like. We do have a question or maybe a comment already that's come in for Roberta, and it says, it is probably the first time I am seeing a CRO is thinking about pricing the treatment well, true patient centricity. Roberta, can you comment on that? I can, thank you. And it is a great question because it is not something that does happen all the time. We have a pricing and market access group who does help um, the sponsors go through with each country with each um, regulatory body how to price it but we've also integrated our patient our patient group into that and we have patient advisory boards that will talk through the possibilities of what makes sense to them what how can we help and so it, it works out really well it's, it's a nice addition to just having um, market access excellent thank you very much we are open for more questions. Uh, I have another one here that says, what is our fastest growing therapeutic area? Um, the answer to that is oncology. And I would tell you, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have a new community framework being set up that allows people to learn, much like Ruben talked about. If oncology is of interest to you, we've built this dynamic where our medics are actually teaching people about the diseases, teaching people about the impacts and studies, what to do so that we can develop that experience as well as, you know, tap into the medics for it. Um, you know, take a look at Cy Pretorius. He's our chief medical officer, and I know he posts a lot of good presentations on LinkedIn. I certainly follow him. He's also a member of our executive leadership team, and he posts all kinds of really interesting things about what's going on with our in-house talent. Okay, uh, another question that's online. Uh, this one is for you, John. Uh, many of you have worked within the industry for many years, including other CROs. Now, given you talked about you didn't come from a CRO, what made you come to Parkcell and why do you stay? Great question, thank you. Um, so I, I think I knew of Par Excel, right? It has a great reputation within in, in the industry that both the depth and breadth of experience that we bring to the table. Um, but ultimately, and I hate to, to even say this, and I don't mean it as a cliche, it was the people. Um, so both why I came and why I stayed. I actually interviewed Kate with Kate uh, about seven years ago. Um, and, you know, for me, it's important about not just sort of the company and the resources that they bring and the, the process and the technology. Par Excel has all of that, and it's very, very impressive. But ultimately, what brought me here and what keeps me here is the people. And I, I hate if that sounds too cliche, but it's absolutely true. Um, and I stand by that, and I love the teams that I work with. What impresses me the most is that we all are here to help. I think, Ruben, you touched upon this. It is a big organization, and as we've all probably faced in our career, sometimes it's not about what you know, but who you know and how you find that information. Uh, and we have a tremendous framework of SMEs or subject matter experts, business process owners that you can go to for support, drop-in sessions. The training is tremendous, but 
I know I can always pick up the phone and call Ruben or call Roberta, and they're the first ones to drop what they're doing and help me. Heck yeah. I mean, I think we would all completely agree with what you're saying, John. It's the people. You know, I also just want to call out, you may have seen in the slides that were revolving the picture of Jamie McDonald um, at the very beginning of the, of the presentation. So our culture has changed dramatically since, um, you know, the last two years. We talked about some of the things that we're doing within our work environment, but the culture and the energy within Parkcell has changed tremendously. You know, if you don't have that network, people are going to help you establish one. People are going to introduce you to people. We've gained a level of alignment towards success that, I mean, I've been here 16 years, and I can tell you it is dramatically different and much more positive today. You know, without any um, negative reflections on the past, where we've gotten to has, is a terrific place. And I think it's fantastic for all of us. Okay, so let's see. We have another question coming in now. This one is for you, Ruben. When someone is hired at Parkcell, how long before they're assigned to a project? In other words, how long do they have to complete their training? Oh, you have to give me the tough one here, right? <laughs> um, I, have, I abide by, by one principle, and that is that Hallmark is the, uh, I mean, that uh, flexibility is the hallmark of mental health. And so in order to apply that is to say that no individual is unique. You know, everybody is different. Um, I can tell you uh, that for me, coming into Par Excel, having the experience that I had, I had no hesitation taking on a project and working through my training on that. However, if you have someone who's newer to Par Excel or is new into project management, we want to give them the time to be able to learn what they need to learn to be able to be a successful project lead. So we work with them on that. The timing of things is we always say project lead, project lead induction is best after a couple of weeks or, or a month of being in the organization because they have already done some training and we are able to reinforce it through the project lead induction week. And the mentor assignment is best always once that person has had an assignment, a project assignment, because otherwise they don't have the questions to ask. Uh, but in any event, it is there is no clear cut. I'm not going to say it's one way or another. It really depends on where you're coming in. Uh, depends if you're going into enterprise and biotech or well, there might be some differences in there. Uh, we just try to make it to the individual and adapt it to the individual because we want them to be successful. Great job, Ruben. Thank you. I'll take the next one, which I think is very timely given um, the topics, which is all companies face challenge with faced challenges with COVID-19. How did Parkcell take on those challenges? And you know, I first I, I would say that at first we were all paralyzed, right? Little shocked. What in the world is this? How does it affect us personally? How does it affect our industry? How does it affect our clients? And how does it affect our patients? And I would say, you know, as, as the shock wore off in nanoseconds, as you can imagine, our leadership started with guidance. We built databases and they came out with very clear instruction about we need to collect information about how are these countries impacted, how were these sites impacted. And then that database gave us information. We could use this. It's in a spot fire system to sort by your client, perhaps your client site perhaps understanding a region, and the information came out. And we were also given guidance on how to engage with our clients about this. I mean, I think that you also heard from Roberta, we immediately expanded our decentralized clinical trial options and worked with clients so that they would understand, can we do things with our patients at home? Can we do remote monitoring? What can we do reading ELT? You know, and we were, I think the creativity, the best in terms of, true creativity throughout the company, everyone engaged. You can see us all here. We're working from home. I'm sure you all are too, right? And we continue to be productive. We've actually found that this works in a lot of ways, in a lot of measurable ways, better. So, you know, I would say that COVID-19 is a horrible disease and a horrible pandemic, but it's brought out a lot of the best in Parkcell. Happy to share more about that. I mean, I, I'm afraid to freestyle here because I'll use up the rest of our time. We do have a couple of other questions here, so I'm going to go ahead and, Roberta, there's another one. If it's okay, can you take this one? It is, okay. can you speak to the commitment to work-life balance at Parkcell? Absolutely, and I think it goes well off of the um, question you just answered, Kate. 
it comes from the top down, obviously. And so when I came from another corporation into here, I did worry about that. A large company, how was my work-life balance going to stay intact? And it has. And I think it goes a lot to your managers and getting to know each person individually and what are your needs and working with you through that. Um, corporate discussion, we talked about Jamie McDonald. Jamie has been very big, especially during COVID, in ensuring that we do keep that work-life balance. Mental health has become a, a more important issue. It's always been important, but even um, more in the headlines during the time of COVID. So working through that talking, basically talking to our teams, talking to our managers, and just striving through what we need. But I've been really happy here with my work-life balance. And I will say I was really concerned. But I, in the six plus years, the work-life balance it is good. You know, and I, there are times we do have ups and downs, but it, it does work out well. It's a good balance. I really agree with your point, too, Roberta, about during COVID-19, you know, the world had to react to really considering people's, you know, the burden, the stress. Of course, some of our employees were afflicted with the disease. People had family challenges. And I think it was also really interesting to see how many people really just, you know, moved monumental stones to help each other because it did, you know, in the world and internally, it brought out the best in people. So that's been good. I think we have time for one more question before we close. And it, I think it's timely to select if I was looking to make a move now or in the near future, why should I consider Parkcell? Ruben, would you like to take that question? Absolutely. Um... I think it, I think John kind of answered this in in his previous answer as well. But it it and as cliche as it sounds, it is the reality that it is. You know, it really is about the people. Um, even though it's a large organization, in your group, and that's what I found in my group, I've been able to make excellent connections, and those connections allow me to influence the organization. As I said earlier, coming in feeling that the new person that doesn't have the knowledge, doesn't have the connections can be intimidating. But if you find the people to, to work with, if you find the ability to express your opinion, I think that's something else that about Parkcell that I like, is you're not shut down for expressing your opinion. Uh, and that is very important because the recognition, I'm not always going to be right, but the recognition that you do have a voice, that you do have an opinion, that it makes you, and it is heard even if it's not use, it's very, very important. I think that's something that I value tremendously from being in this organization. And 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 I'd say no matter which group somebody gets assigned or works with, my experience has been the same with everyone that I work with so far. I have to, just because it was my presentation, here I am talking about the people, but I was the guy giving the presentation on technology. So, you know, of course, the people are hugely important, but just think back to my presentation. We are Revolutionizing the way that we do business day in day out with that new system and that integration. So I'm I'm super excited and you know all things created equal, people, process, technology, we win in all all of them. And you know I really think, of course, I can't um, you know but add to this. I hope that we are all personifying the internal energy that is here at Parkcell. We're super excited about being here. We're super excited to bring on um, new folks in many different roles. You know, we're very passionate about project leadership and we're here. Let's go ahead to the slide that actually shows, um, you know, a follow-up uh, that is available. We would love for all of you to LinkedIn, connect with us. Um, we will be sharing the presentation um, and making sure you all have that. There, can you go to the next slide? Thank you so much. So here's our email addresses. If we didn't have time to get to your questions, if there are other questions, or if you think of one later and you want to reach out to us, Feel free to email any one of us or all of us. I love that picture, too. They uh, whited out the bags under my eyes, bud. Um, <laughs> thank you for laughing, Roberta. You know, we really enjoy our jobs. We really hope to hear from you. We look forward um, to connecting. And you will be getting, we, are going to, we did record this session. You'll be getting a copy of the session. And I think we're okay to go ahead and draw our winner, by the way. You can also link me on the Fitbit network and we can compete with each other if you're interested. You will win most days. But we are, um, go ahead to select our Fitbit Versa 2 winner. Um, let's see, Jackie, do you have that? and Or will we just be following up with folks? 
Yeah, we'll, we'll be selecting the winner from um, the list of attendees who stayed for the duration of the presentation, and we will follow up with them directly via email. Excellent. And if you have Fitbits and you want to reach out to me anyway and just join us, feel free. You know, we really are here with heart. We mean every word we're saying, you know, very genuinely, and we really hope to hear from you. Thank you all very much for staying. Thank you to the presenters for your wonderful presentation. This is, uh, you know, really exciting. So great to hear all of this. Thank you to our colleagues who helped to manage the infrastructure for us today. Thank you, Missy, for advancing the slides. We really appreciate you. All right. Thanks, so everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.